So, I nearly gave up using Jupiter Lab because it was, it seemed a bit, oh, this music's too loud <laughs> for me. I nearly gave up using Jupiter Lab because it felt a bit strange, uh, but now I've started to see the benefits because when I first started running code in Spider, I didn't like the fact that you had to just hit run and it just ran the whole program. I liked the idea of being able to write new kind of modules. It's more like the way that you write SAS and R, that as you as you kind of develop new bits of code, you just run those because you know all the stuff above that works anyway. So um, I like it. I think I like it. I like the fact that it's online. I'm not taking up space on my hard drive. The files, I think, are just being saved online, which is pretty cool. I think that's what's happening. Um, and I also found that you could just go run, uh, restart kernel and run all cells. And that was something that when, when I came to it today, I guess nothing was, nothing was like loaded into the memory. So if you tried to run the last block of code, it was like, uh, you know, it, it, it didn't have anything loaded in. So I had to go run, restart kernel, run all cells, and I'm now back. So the last thing that was plotted was our. Yes, and I remember the fares seem to be high between 5 a.m. and 10 a.m. It certainly looks like there are some more of the sort of outlier type fares in that region. Two till four. Wait a minute. Yeah, she's talking about these values here. So next question, does the day of the week, let me just check that, so I've done hour, right, so now we're on day of the week, copy, and then run, oh, does that work, yes, that works, does the day of the week, now nah, what's a zero, nah, <laughs> nah, Day of the week doesn't seem to have that much of an influence on the number of cab rides. See a bit of a trend there. So now we're going to plot day of the week. help thinking that say if you were going to work the weekend you might charge a bit more than if you were working during the week you might but I don't know the highest fares seem to be on a Sunday and a Monday and the lowest on Wednesday and Friday maybe people travel far distances on Sunday and Monday and hence the high fare oh yeah so we yeah we it's a one-way analysis, isn't it? So sitting behind this data could be a range of other factors. It's not the, is it, it's not the, is it the average fare? I kind of, it kind of is, isn't it? Okay. Going really deep with the analysis. Maybe people, tr people travel far distances on Sunday and Monday, and hence the high fares, and guess people just want to stay at home on a Friday. 
or grab a drink from close by. Hum. Does distance affect fare? This is a no-brainer. I am confident that the distance would affect the fare a great deal, but I will visualise it. Firstly, let's check the frequency of the distances that we calculated using the have assigned formula. I will do so by creating bins 0 to 10, 10 to 20 and so on. Now that's good. Copy. And run. What does that do? to maximize the screen. Oh, that's a good table. So this is descending order of h distance. The lowest values are zeros. The highest value is 12,594. A 12,000 mile journey. Okay. What next? Len train. Yeah, I think we've already done that. Okay, so now she's defining all these bins. Right, let's have a look at bins naught equals naught, bins one greater than zero, less than or equal to 10, greater than 10, less than or equal to 50, greater than 50, blah, 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 greater than 100, greater than 200, greater than 300. Bins naught bins equals ah oh. so it's got that I think probably labels them Index. Strange. Let's have a look at the thing. Run it. X label is bins, Y label is frequency. It's still running. I hope I don't have to debug anything. <laughs> That's not going to be good. That would not go well. What's happening? Just waiting for something to happen.
Hmm. Strange. Someone's wrong. I might have to stop the stream while I work out what's going on. It's a bit strange, everything's just kind of frozen up. So what happens if I... Everything seemed fine until I did this last bit. So what happens if you do restart and run all? How long does that take? Scroll to the top. Is it running?
So I think that the code has run up to 33, the magic number, and now it's running the bit, the bit of code that changes a couple of the objects to date time always takes a, a little while to run. So it kind of hangs on this cell and then moves on to the rest. So it looks like it's working. Oh, I know what I could do. I could put n rows equals 10,000. So yesterday I gave up on this problem because I couldn't work out what was going on and I just think that it's one of those things that at some point it will become clear but there's no point in just halting everything and digging into it because I've, I've had a really good look. I copied all the code over into Spider because I didn't think that this was a particularly nice environment to do debugging in. I'm sure I'll learn but sometimes I like to be able to skim read all the code rather than having all this stuff in between all the instructions. So I, I put it in Spider and I had a really good look at it and I googled around and I cannot work out why this was obviously working for, um, for the person who made the blog So, what I'm going to do, I'm going to press on, because it looks like the next instructions work fine. It was just, I couldn't do, basically, I couldn't do a histogram of the bins. But I'm just going to go up to the code that makes the bins, and I'm just going to talk, because it's kind of clicked for me. So... In my mind, what it's doing, it's creating a data set or a data frame or whatever kind of object called bins naught, where the h distance, which is the have assigned distance, is equal to zero. And in that file, it's putting the h distance. So, what would you expect to see in bins naught? Um, remember that it's got two things in it. Yes. Initially, bins 0 will have one thing in it, it'll have the h distance. And then bins 1 is if it's greater than 0, or if it's greater than 0, or less than or equal to 10, then it goes into this bins 1 data set, and again it's one column h distance. It does that six times to create six different data sets. Then it creates a column bins in each of those data sets and in bins naught the column bins has zero for every row and in bins one it has zero to ten for every row and so on all the way down and then eventually it concatenates all the different data sets together to create a dist bins data set now last year i was working for a really experienced sas programmer and it, he was never keen on an approach that created so many different data sets and he would probably rewrite this step so that it all gets done within the original data set and just some new column gets appended and certainly that's something that SAS is really good at so in SAS you'd have some kind of data step that does an if then and it goes and it reads each row of data which is what SAS does anyway and it would just apply, it would just add a column. If h distance equals zero, then bin equals zero. Else, if h distance between, then bin equals, and so on. I hope that's clear. Um, so that's the kind of thing you do in SAS. I've tried actually doing stuff like this in R, there are ways of doing it that tend to be quite slow and then there are other ways of doing it that tend to be 
catastrophically slow and you can crash your computer. I don't think R handles this kind of situation very well. And personally, I kind of like the way this has been done, but it just depends how much data you've got and how long you can tolerate your program running for. I suspect there's a slightly quicker way of doing it, but at the moment, this code seems to run pretty quick anyway. So, I'm Poppy Harlow. I don't like to give my opinion, but that's my opinion. So, the next command, I tested this earlier, it seems to work okay. Counter 0, 0279, 0 to 10, 9198. So the vast majority of the data sits in the first and second. No. No. Oh, I hate the way it sorts it like this. So, start again. You get this sorting thing where it goes, well, this one starts with a 1, and this one starts with a 1. I mean, obviously, banding 11 to 50 should come before 100 to 200, but... Python doesn't know that, so I'll I'll say that the vast majority of the journeys. Ah, oh, I don't think you can have zero and zero to ten. It seems a little imprecise to say that because the title of the two bandings sort of overlap. So I feel like I want to rename these a bit, you know. I'm going to rename these. Bins 0. So greater than 0, less than or equal to 10. 1 to 10. 101 to 200. 201 to 300. Greater than 300. It's not very precise. Can I run this again? Run it again. So this will be interesting. Can I run this again? So if I click on that and run it. I know it's not strictly true, but it, it just, to me, it seems a bit clearer. So 1 to 10, 9,198, which is the vast majority of them. The next banding is 11 to 50. So most of these taxi journeys are basically greater than zero and less than or equal to 10. Then the next segment is 11 to 50. And then the next segment is zero, which is a little strange because it's a journey which is equal to zero. And I think this is what comes next. Right. There are values which are greater than 100 kilometers. There are 12 of those. In New York City, I'm not sure why people would take cabs to travel more than 100 kilometers. Since the number of bins for 100 to 200 is quite high, let me go back right to the top. Oh no. This is me meddling. I'm going to have to maximise their window. Right. I am reading in 10,000 rows. It should be a million, I think. kernel, restart kernel and run all cells. I do want to do that. Thank you. Oh dear. Could do without this, can we? So how long is it going to take? running. 
Oh, this is actually pretty good. For me, the jury's out. I'm not sure what environment I prefer. I like to see all the code clustered together. I've got my code here and my output there. More of a sort of R, SAS sort of environment, but I know that in R, there was a way, I can't remember what it's called now, but there was a way that you could basically make a PDF so that you've got your code and then the results and then the code and the results. And I've got a book somewhere that was written by somebody using that. Hadley Wickham, Advanced Advanced R by Hadley Wickham. This was all written in R. This is pretty amazing. couple of books there that I want to... Ah, oh, still running. So this thing of converting a million rows from object to date time is taking forever. How long have I been streaming? 10 minutes. Let's get that music back on. Okay, it's run. I'm actually starting to quite like this environment. Oh, come on. Yay. Oh, what's going on? Right. What's going on? Oh, it's still running. It's just still running the last few bits. Okay, here we are. Let's go back to split screen. Counter zero two eight four eight one one to ten nine two oh oh seven one two oh six. So what she's saying is 100 to 200 is quite high. I will keep these. These outliers could be because of typos or missing values in latitude or longitude. Remove fields of the following. Pick up latitude and pick up longitude are zero, but drop off latitude and longitude are not zero, but the fare is zero. There's some serious data cleaning going on here. Pick up latitude and longitude equals zero. What's it doing? Why is it doing that? Okay, because it is one long row. Drop it. Never pay cells, that's my experience, messes everything up. Just control V.
Right. Interesting. I've got less. Something I noticed while I was trying to find out about this problem, I wasn't sure what the U's were doing here. Index U, H distance, U bins. I could get this, I might be getting this wrong, but from the googling I was doing, do you seem to refer to Unicode? Please somebody correct me if I'm wrong. I'd like to know, but it seemed to refer to Unicode. Okay, so for some reason, I don't have as many rows in my data anymore as she did. But I haven't done anything differently. Yes, I have. Yes, I have. I dropped some more because I, I, I corrected something. I think I corrected it. Okay, so that's okay. Check in test data. So it looks like there are no records in the test data. That's gone a bit slow. So let's just quickly recap what's going on here. It's better if you can see all the code actually. So first of all, we look in the test data, we say pick up latitude equals zero and pick up longitude equals zero and drop off latitude equals zero and drop off longitude equals zero. So basically, really rubbish records. I really want these to look consistent. Uh, uh, same again here. So let me just recap properly this time. So we've got train. So we did it to train where it was all zero and we dropped one row. Then we checked it in test. We found there were no rows. But now, what is software report at all? I didn't download that. <laughs> Great. So, check in test data. Don't we did that? Drop off latitude and longitude equals zero. Ah, right. So now we're back in the training data. What's going on? What's the difference between this one? Train, lock, pick up latitude. Ah. Ah. So in this case, it was equals, equals, not equal, not equal. Then equals, equals, not equal, not equal. Crikey.
Okay, and then this time it's not equals zero, not equals zero, equals zero, equals zero, but always where the fair amount is zero. Okay, I got it. So it found some records. Really? Why did it? Okay. Can I change the text size a bit? Maybe I shouldn't. So we found these three records and now we're going to remove the three records. Three rows dropped. And run. Yes, it dropped three records. Check the test data. Again, no records, awesome. Check the H, H distance fields, which are greater than 200 kilometers, because there's no way that people would travel more than 200 kilometers in New York City in a cab. It's an interesting one, isn't it? Define New York City. How big is New York City? Thirteen point four miles long and two point three miles wide. That's Manhattan Island. High distance equals train lock so what's happening here I feel like I want my hands to look like that okay fine that's run is interesting. Oh great, that's like R. Oh, you just type the name of the data set and up it pops. So we've created a separate data set that has all the high distances. So the H distance here is like crazy, crazy. So they've got all these records with crazy H distances, but they have fair amount two pound fifty five pound seventy forty five dollars obviously so what she does is she works backwards then 
1938 rows wait where does it say that okay mine's slightly different because I did something different 1929 High distance shape. Hmm. Let's run that. See if I get the same output. A value is trying to be set on a copy of a slice from a data frame. Try using dot lock. She got the warning. Let's just check that then. Wow. There's something a little weird going on because when there was a fair amount of two dollars fifty the h distance got set to zero when there was a fair amount of five dollars seventy two dollars five eight ninety four dollars ten forty I gotta get my units right two dollars fifty gave us a distance of zero five dollars seventy gave a distance of two eight dollars ninety gave a distance of four and forty five dollars gave a distance of twenty seven so the only one that looks a bit odd to me is that that zero. Ah, but it makes sense because it was calculated on the distance minus two dollars fifty. Okay, cool. Move on. Streaming for twenty-seven minutes. interesting so you can update train with the high distance values That's, that seems really powerful there's always so much to learn when you start a new programming language isn't there Shall check for rows where the distance values are zero. Let's do that. And here they are. But that was okay, wasn't it? Because like the two dollar fifty one had a distance of zero. Twenty eight thousand six hundred and sixty seven rows. We can see a few rows with distance zero. This could be due to two reasons. The cab waited the whole time and the passenger eventually cancelled. That's why the pickup and drop off, co drop off coordinates are the same and maybe the passenger was charged for the waiting time. The pickup and drop off coordinates were not entered. In other words, these are missing values. 28,000 rows are too many to be deleted. We need to impute these missing values. I have a plan. I intend to impute the missing distance values with the fare and average price per kilometre of NYC cabs. A quick Google search gave me the following prices. $2.50 brace, uh, base price plus $1.56 per kilometre, 6 to 8pm, 
three dollar base price plus 156 per kilometer 8 p.m. to 6 a.m. however before we proceed let's check for the following scenarios to impute the missing fare amount and the h distance wow scenario one fare and distance are both zero delete Here we go, four rows, get rid of them. Scenario 2. Fare is not zero and is less than the base amount, but distance is zero. Delete these rows, as the minimum fare is $2.50. Crikey, between... Wow. So between 6 a.m. and 8 p.m. Train equals train drop. Train equals train drop. Rush hour index. Axis equals zero. Hello. Um, let's just see what happens. I ran that, I believe. Between 8 p.m. and 6 a.m., non rush hour, specify the hours, specify the day of the week. Distance is zero, fair amount is less than three. Run it. So it gives us a list. So these should have a fair amount of less than three, which they do. And it's before six, before 6 a.m., for example, the first one. Okay. going on there. Weekends, day of the week. Mm -hmm. So we're going to keep these as well. Okay.
Scenario 3. Fair is 0, but distance is not 0. These values need to be imputed. I can calculate the fair as I have the distance. I shall use the following formula. Fair equals 2.5 plus 156 times h distance. Isn't that great? I like it. So what's this? Train lock train h distance not equal to zero. So they went some distance, but the fare was zero. There's not very many of them. So here we're just counting them. So let's actually count them. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 21. Len scenario 3, 21. So we're sorting by h distance, yeah, and in this, this is in the 21, isn't it, just in this scenario 3, it goes 16, 14, 10, 3, 2, and then lots of very low numbers. And now we're going to impute the fair amount. Same error message. Scenario 3, fair amount. Let's have a look at that. They look nice. Train update scenario 3. And then have a quick look at the shape. My shape will be slightly different. I think it's always a difference of about nine rows. And finally, scenario four. Fair is not zero, but distance is zero. These values need to be imputed. I don't know how she keeps up with all these scenarios. I'm not keeping up with them. Distance equals naught. Fair amount not equal to naught. There's 28,000. I thought we'd done something with these already. Perhaps not specifically these ones. Scenario 4 equals distance 0, fair amount non zero. Length scenario four. Twenty-eight thousand six hundred and sixty-one. Using our prior knowledge about the base price, I do not want to impute these fifteen hundred and two, as they are legible ones. Scenario 4, lock. Scenario 4, fair amount less than or equal to 3. Scenario 4, h distance equals 0.
my uh, OBS connection dropped, but the um, the data cleansing had gone on for quite a long time, so I just carried on for a couple of minutes and finished it. But it probably wasn't a need to do that on the stream. So I'm back. We have. The training data set now has 999,901 rows. So out of a million, we've dropped a hundred rows in all of the data cleaning. And we've also, I think, imputed some fares onto some that didn't have fares and imputed some distance onto some that didn't have distances. And so it begins. modeling and prediction so data cleaning looks like it's about 70% of the uh, the work but let's have a look at train columns first key fair amount Pick up date time, pick up longitude, pick up latitude, drop off longitude, drop off latitude, passenger count, H distance, year, month, date, day of week, hour. So it's got the raw data stuff in it. It's got the H distance, year, month, date, day of week, and hour. Okay, now, it'd be interesting, does she have the... Have I done something wrong? Why do I have a U next to everything? She doesn't. Then what does a U mean? That's because they're Unicode strings. The U in front of the string values means the string has been represented as Unicode. Letters before strings are called string encoding declarations. Unicode is a way to represent more characters than the normal ASCII can manage. You can convert string to Unicode in multiple ways. But I didn't want to convert it to Unicode. Why is it Unicode and why is mine different to hers? We may never know. It'll be interesting to see if it starts to fail on more things. Train columns, test columns. So the training data set has fair amount and the test data set doesn't. Fine. Not including the pickup date time columns, as the date time columns cannot be directly used while modelling. So drop pickup date time from both. Look. Train 
columns. I don't like all these U's. I don't like it at all. Test columns. train fair amount y train fair amount all will become clear I'm sure let's have a look at X train train columns longitude latitude da, da, da. Oh, so I think we've we've dropped fair amount X train is the factors and Y train is the response variable. X train columns done. Y train shape. test shape and finally X test columns random forest from SK learn ensemble import random forest regressor RF equals random forest regressor RF fit X train Y train RF predict equals RF predict X text X test. Okay. As how long is that gonna take? So it looks like this type of model takes the first parameter is the factors and the second parameter is the response variable. And I suspect that that RF predict is actually running the model on X, te X test, which gives us a set of predicted values. This could take a while to run on a million rows.
Let's have a look at this RF predict. It's an array, 9.9, 11.55, 4.22, 48.22, blah, blah, blah. And just a reminder, that's what we're trying to do, isn't it? Is to create some predicted values. So we build a model from the training data set and then use that to predict values, to predict taxi fares on the test data set. That's what we're trying to do. Oh, crikey, we're getting close. We can actually do a submission if we want to here. Oh, I can't believe it. After all that, nah. Interesting. Okay, so sample submission. There it is. Go there and do that. Okay, so this reads in the sub sample submission. Reads in the sample submission. Then in the fair amount co column, it puts RF predict. Then it does to CSV. run it so I'm hoping the next step is to export has it been exp I don't think it's been exported Python export CSV. No. Let me go to here. Okay, so where's it going? Some sort of Python folder, I would have thought.
So in this program, which worked, I think, submission, key, columns, submission to CSV. So it literally goes straight to the C drive. Nope. <laughs> uh, it goes somewhere. Wait a minute. Found it. Cut. We have a submission. So, open another Kaggle window. I think this deserves a bit of music. So my current position on the leaderboard is
working through Maduri Sivalenko's kernel. This is the first set of results using from sklearn ensemble import random forest regressor. regressor. Make submission. What are 64 cores? <laughs> Flippin' heck! You advanced 211 places on the leaderboard. Okay, so I'm at 191. Let's see if we can find her. There! Oh, I am closing in. <laughs> Using your code. Uh, so she's currently at 3.339. I'm at 3.39. So this gives us a real kind of thing to aim for now, doesn't it? Hmm. Okay. How long I've been streaming for? 23 minutes. It just feels like a really good place to finish another video and I might compile, I think I've got three videos on Kaggle that aren't on YouTube now because there's one from yesterday well, there's one from yesterday that went wrong there's one from today when OBS disconnected and then there's this one from after when OBS reconnected so I think I'll edit all of those together put them on YouTube the last one that I uploaded to YouTube has had four four views so it's very exciting times on my channel at the moment but it's more important really it's about learning so I don't care thank you for watching and uh, I'll be back soon with the next installment of uh, Toby beats Maduri on the leaderboard thanks a lot bye